All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video today, we are going to talk about the cerebral cortex, but we're going to primarily focus on the frontal lobe, all the basic functional anatomy of the frontal lobe. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, Ninja Nerds, so what I want us to first do is cover the basic kind of like functional anatomy and then talk about the basic functions of these different kind of areas located within the frontal lobe. Well, the first thing that we have to do when we talk about the frontal lobe is develop an understanding of the boundaries of the frontal lobe. That's kind of like a really kind of an anatomical portion that we have to discuss. So the way I like to remember the boundaries is what separate, how do we separate this lobe, the frontal lobe, this entire area here with all these colors? How do we separate this lobe from this lobe here and this lobe here? Well, we actually should come up with a name for these lobes, right? This lobe here, this like kind of like thing here, or this wing, this is called your temporal lobe. And we're going to talk about this separately in another video. And then this one back here, which is bordered by this sulcus, we're not going to mention this now, and this sulcus, which we will discuss, is called your parietal lobe, right? So these are two lobes. How does my frontal lobe, which is this one right here, this whole one in color, how do I separate this from the parietal lobe? Well, separating it from the parietal lobe, there's this black line, this sulcus that separates frontal from parietal. What is this guy here called? We're going to number it. One. This one. This is called the central sulcus, right? So the central sulcus. That basically performs a boundary that separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. The second one is this sulcus right here. This sulcus here that runs in between separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. What is this sulcus here? This is called your lateral sulcus. Or sometimes you might even see it written as the Sylvian fissure. But I like the simple ways, the lateral sulcus. So separate the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe by the central sulcus and frontal from temporal by the lateral sulcus. Okay? Okay, beautiful. Now, we got to talk about some of these functional areas located within the frontal lobe. Let's start just anterior to the central sulcus and work our way uh, kind of forward through here. So the first one is this red portion here. Now, just anterior to the central sulcus, we, there's a gyrus here, which is just like a big kind of like mountain. And then there's little furrows in between the mountain, which are called your sulci, right? This gyrus here is actually called your precentral gyrus, but that's the structural anatomical term. The functional portion of this gyrus is actually referred to as the primary motor cortex. So it's called the primary motor cortex. And the basic function of this primary motor cortex is it is involved in voluntary movement, particularly of skeletal muscles. Okay, voluntary movement. So if there's one way to describe it, voluntary movement. All right, beautiful. Go just a little bit anterior, right? So here we had our primary motor cortex. Go just a little bit anterior to this. Then you have this next functional lobe. This next functional lobe in this navy blue color is called, it's actually called your motor association cortex. So it's actually called your motor association cortex, but it's made up of two components. It's actually made up of what's called the pre-motor cortex, and another one, which we're gonna just abbreviate right now, called the supplementary motor area, or supplementary motor cortex. These two areas make up this blue portion called the motor association cortex. Their job is relatively straightforward. They're involved in movement, but particularly the planning of movement, the sequence of movement, and the, also the execution and the execution of movement. Okay? Boom. All right. So we have the primary motor cortex and the motor association cortex, which is made up of two areas, the premotor cortex and the we're going to actually be more specific and put the supplementary motor area or cortex. All right. Involved in planning, sequencing, and execution of movement. All right. So we hit the primary motor cortex. We hit the motor association cortex, which is made up of premotor and supplementary motor cortex. 
move a little bit anterior. This right here is another special structure called the frontal eye fields. What is this structure here called? It is called the frontal eye fields. And these are really cool structure and they're involved with particularly voluntary, rapid, or sometimes referred to as cicadic eye movements. And we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail what I mean with this. But for right now, if you just had to come up with a really simple way of explaining the frontal eye fields, it's involved in voluntary rapid eye movements. Okay, the next structure here. We covered the primary motor. We covered the premotor supplementary motor. We covered the frontal eye fields. Now, move a little bit more anterior. You have this big portion here in this baby blue color. What is this one? This is called your prefrontal cortex. What is it called? your prefrontal cortex. Now sometimes it's actually more specifically referred to as your prefrontal association area. But for right now, we're gonna stick with prefrontal cortex and I'll explain what I, it actually more in detail what it does. But for right now, the basic function of the prefrontal cortex is it's involved with memory, right? So memory and learning, that's one big thing. So it's involved with memory and learning. It's also involved, very interestingly, in motor planning. So it does have some involvement in motor planning because it interacts with the basal ganglia. And then the other thing is it's involved with our personality and our behavior. Very cool, right? Okay, so we have that function of prefrontal cortex being memory, learning, motor planning, and even personality and behavior. Okay. The last area that I want to talk about and point out here, which is in the frontal lobe, is this orange lobe, right? This orange portion here. This orange portion in the frontal lobe is actually called Broca's area, okay? So this, this area is called Broca's area. Now, one thing I want to make sure that we point out is that this Broca's area is actually found particularly in the dominant hemisphere of a patient. So in other words, if a person is right-handed, Broca's area will more likely be on the left side of that frontal lobe, okay? So Broca's area. Broca's area, again, remember, what do you need to know about Broca's area? It is usually in right-handed people, is actually in the left frontal lobe, okay? Now, the next thing I want you to remember here is Broca's area, not only is it only located in the dominant hemisphere, which is usually in right-handed people, left frontal lobe, it's involved with muscles, of speech. So it's involved in the muscles that help us to produce speech. All right, so that covers the basic functional anatomy and the basic kind of just one sentence function of each one of these cortical areas. Now, let's really dig into detail in each one of these and really discuss them in clinical correlations. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about a little bit more detail the primary motor cortex, right? We said that it's involved in voluntary motor movement, right? Now, how is it involved in voluntary motor movement? Okay, you guys gotta remember, again, where is the primary motor cortex? Just anterior to the central sulcus in this portion here, right? And this is actually, the anatomical term for this is called the precentral gyrus. Now, the primary motor cortex is very interesting because it descends down from the cortex to the brainstem and to the spinal cord, the final motor plan. So when it sends this motor information down, it sends it down via what's called two tracks. One track will go all the way down to the spinal cord and innervate the neurons of the anterior gray horn. This will then activate the neurons of the anterior gray horn that will come out of the spinal cord and go to the muscles, particularly of limbs, trunk, right? Limbs and trunk, particularly your axial and kind of appendicular skeleton. This tract going from your cortex all the way down to your spinal cord is called the cortico spinal tract. And there's two types, your ventral and your, uh, your lateral cortico spinal tract. Regardless of that, again, the way that it actually causes voluntary movement is it sends a motor plan from your cortex down to your spinal cord out to the muscles.
okay? The other thing is it not just is the muscles of the limbs in the trunk, but also muscles of kind of the, the head and neck area as well. So on the way down, sometimes it also gives innervation to some nuclei located within the brainstem. Like what nuclei? Well, particularly motor nuclei of particular cranial nerves that supply skeletal muscles of the head and neck. Like which ones? Well, the first one is your trigeminal nerve. Your trigeminal nerve is what? Cranial nerve five. And cranial nerve five supplies what? Muscles of mastication, your chewing muscles. It also will innervate, what else? This red neuron here. This is your facial nerve. Facial nerve is also known as cranial nerve seven. And cranial nerve seven supplies the muscles of facial expression, okay? The blue one, this is actually a combination of multiple neurons here. Actually, uh, cranial nerves, nine, 10, and the cranial part of 11, which is the accessory nerve. So we're not gonna write all that down, I'm just gonna put down here cranial nerve, nine, which is your glossopharyngeal, cranial nerve, 10, which is your vagus, and cranial nerve, 11, which is the accessory nerve. These supply both the glossopharyngeal and vagus, the muscles of your pharynx, your uvula, your soft palate, your larynx, and then the accessory nerve, it can also supply some of those muscles, but it also supplies the sternocleidomastoid and your trapezius muscles, okay? The other thing is it can come down and stimulate this nucleus here, which goes to your tongue. Do you guys know what nucleus this is? This is the hypoglossal nucleus, which will go via the hypoglossal nerve. And the hypoglossal nerve is actually known as cranial nerve 12. So the motor cortex not only can uh, communicate with the spinal cord, but it can also communicate with these cranial nerve nuclei. And this is a special tract. The tract going from the motor cortex to these cranial nerve nuclei is actually referred to as the cortico bulbar tract. So when I say it's involved with voluntary control of motor movements, this is how it is involved in it. So again, it's involved in voluntary motor movements and how? The way we just described all of it. Isn't that cool? All right, there's one other thing that we have to talk about here. And it's very important, especially when it comes to clinical correlation. This um, primary motor cortex it has a specific somatotopic arrangement that we have to discuss. What does that mean? Let's come down and discuss and what this means. All right, so now what I want you to imagine is we take that area of the cerebral cortex, right? So if I were to kind of just give you a mini diagram here, imagine here I have that cerebrum here and I'm taking that, I'm taking that central sulcus here and I'm taking a slice right here. Okay, so here's my slice, and I'm really zooming in on this portion in a coronal view. So this is what we're seeing. When you look at it, here's all of your primary motor cortex. All of this that I'm kind of like, uh, kind of shading here in these lines, this is all your motor cortex. Which motor cortex? Primary motor cortex. Well, remember I told you that the motor cortex basically gives off its axons, right? That come down and do what? Supply the muscles of the corticospinal tract, CST, or corticobulbar tract, which is the muscles of limb and the uh, trunk, and then the muscles of the head and the neck. Well, if we really look at where the neurons that are controlling more of the limbs, trunk, head, and neck is, it's organized in this particular type of somatotopic arrangement. That's very important. I like to remember it very simply. If you look at it here, you see foot, which is the most medial portion, kind of going into the calf, to knee, to the thigh, to the hip area, working your way up towards the top and moving laterally. You got the trunk, you got the shoulder, you got the arm, you got the forearm, you got the hand here. Then as we're continuously working laterally and down, you have your head, neck, and then the tongue and some of the muscles involved with speech and swallowing down here at the bottom, right? Most inferior and lateral. That is very important, right? There's two reasons why, okay? One of the reasons, there's two things that we need to take away from this. One is that obviously based upon a particular area, right, of the cerebral cortex, the neurons coming down is dependent upon which area you're at. So more medial aspect is gonna be where? 
that's going to be lower extremity. More of the lateral aspect is going to be upper extremity. And as you go most lateral and inferior, you're going to be talking about face and neck area, right? Now, what is this called? There's a special name for this whole thing where we draw like a little man in this area. What is this called? This is referred to as a motor homunculus. And this is one of the ways, homunculus, the ways that we describe somatotopic arrangement of the primary motor cortex. There's a second thing I want you to take away, not just kind of the way that this is arranged, but also the size of particular body parts, right? The size of the body part, there's a reason for that. If you kind of look at the hands, if you look at the face, if you look at the tongue, these are larger than some of the other actual organ uh, body parts. The reason why is the larger the body part, the more motor units, okay? This means more motor units. That means if there's more motor units, that means that there's more fine control, fine motor control involved. So if you think about it, there's more fine motor movement involved within your hands and within your tongue than there is within your toes and in your, your, your thigh area, okay? So that's a big thing I want you to take away from this. Larger the body part, that we see in this motor homunculus, the more motor units are going to it because it needs more fine motor control. The other aspect is that this is important because when people develop strokes, you guys know that there is um, a, an artery supply here, right? Let's say that there's an artery that supplies this entire kind of area here, okay? This is actually referred to as the anterior cerebral artery. So the anterior cerebral artery supplies most of the medial aspect of the primary motor cortex. The other one, which supplies most of the lateral portion of the cerebral cortex is which one? This is actually via the middle cerebral artery. So if someone develops an occlusion or an embolus that blocks the middle cerebral artery. Where is the actual motor deficit gonna be? More, if you look over here, where? Upper extremity, head, neck area, right? So that's important. If it's the anterior cerebral artery, it's gonna affect more of the medial portion. What is this? Lower limbs, bottom part, you know, bottom part of the trunk. So the easy way to remember it is, if there is a, um, basically an occlusion of the anterior cerebral artery, which part, which motor deficit are you gonna see? Well, it's affecting more of the medial aspect, which is where your lower limbs are. So you're gonna see more lower extremity, what? Paralysis, right? All right, beautiful. But if it's the middle cerebral artery that's actually occluded, and it's not delivering blood to that part of the motor cortex, which area of the body is gonna be actually having the paralysis? Well, think about it. This is more lateral. So this is gonna be more upper extremity, head and neck region. So we're just gonna put upper extremity, okay? But do realize that it could, the more lateral you go, it obviously could affect even face, head, neck area, okay? All right, so that covers the basic thing that I want you guys to know about the primary motor cortex, its basic function, how those functions are actually carried out, the motor homunculus, the significance of it with respect to the size of that uh, basic body part and motor unit, and the clinical correlation behind it. All right, the last thing I wanna mention here with respect to the primary motor cortex is sometimes this can come up in exams where generally we apply a name, right, to this particular area of the cerebral cortex called the primary motor cortex. But there was a guy named Broadman who actually came up with uh, particularly uh, a way that he likes to describe the different areas of the cerebral cortex. And he gave a number to that particular cortex. And he liked to call this number, oh, well, this cortex, Broadman area number four. So sometimes you can't see these Broadman areas come up on exams. So remember, primary motor cortex is also known as Broadman area number four. All right, let's move on. All right, so now let's talk about the... Again, what is the name for the combined effect of these two? It's called the motor association cortex, right? Which is made up of the premotor cortex and the supplementary motor cortex. Now, if we're really being specific, right? So again, here's your central sulcus right here, right? That black line there. Just anterior to it is going to be your primary motor cortex. 
Now, if I were to really be specific, the premotor cortex and the supplementary motor cortex, they actually technically are different defined areas. If I were to draw the more lateral portion here in this blue color, this navy blue color, this is your premotor cortex. To really differentiate it, technically, this little piece up here, more medial superior portion, that is technically your supplementary motor cortex. But we're just going to consider this entire area here a part of what? This entire area here is actually called your motor association cortex. All right. Beautiful. The premotor cortex and supplementary motor cortex, they're very interesting. One of the things that I think is really cool about these is that they also contribute to voluntary motor movement, right? So they're also involved in voluntary motor movement. But here's what's very interesting. They're more involved in fine motor movement, okay? And they contribute to the corticospinal tract. Now, portion-wise, if we were to give an actual percentage, it's somewhere around 15% contribution to the corticospinal tract, right? Now, if you guys remember from the corticospinal tract, that was coming from what area? That was coming from the primary motor cortex, and it was coming down here and going all the way down to the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord and acting on these lower motor neurons here, right? Well, in the same way, this premotor and supplementary motor area can also give their axon that can contribute into this entire thing here that is called the corticospinal tract. But here's where we actually have to be a little bit more specific. It does contribute to the corticospinal tract, but we have a little man here, right? This is our little man here. When it actually supplies these lower motor neurons, these lower motor neurons only go to particular muscles. And the particular muscles that it goes to is actually gonna be more the proximal extremities. So your hip and shoulders, and it's also gonna supply the muscles of the trunk. So when we talk about muscles that this is contributing, what's actually supplying being a contribution to the corticospinal tract, it's really only supplying what kind of muscles here? Well, your trunk, what's your trunk muscles called? It's called your axial musculature. So it's supplying the axial muscles and it's supplying the proximal muscle musculature, right? So it's supplying the proximal limbs, which is the hip and shoulder joint. So that's actually how it is contributing to the corticospinal tract, but it's more particularly involved with fine motor movement of those muscle areas, okay? Now, that's one function of the premotor and supplementary motor cortex. There's another involvement of them. Remember I told you that they're involved with planning, sequencing, and execution of the movement. How? Let's talk about it. All right, so remember I told you that it's involved in three particular functions, right? What do we say? It's involved with the planning of movement, okay? It's involved with the sequencing of movement, okay? And it's involved with the execution of movement. This is actually a really cool thing. So remember we said that we had the primary motor cortex, right? Which is right here. And then we're just going to draw all one area, that entire motor association uh, cortex, which is this entire area made up of the premotor and the supplementary motor cortex. Here's what's really cool. Obviously, the motor plan will go down to your skeletal muscles, right? So it has to go down to your skeletal muscles and stimulate lower motor neurons right? That'll go out to your skeletal muscles. We know that. But you know what else is really interesting? And also we know that the, this cortex, the premotor and supplementary is also contributing to this. But regardless, here's what's really cool. The premotor and supplementary motor cortex have communications with two particular structures. <laughs> this is so cool. One is your basal ganglia. They love to communicate with the basal ganglia which are involved in kind of helping to initiate motor movements, prevent unwanted motor movements, and modify motor movements in a particular way. So how does it do, do this? The premotor cortex can actually communicate. So the premotor and supplementary motor area can actually communicate with one another. And they communicate with one another to come up with actually some type of modified motor activity. So basically helping to initiate uh, mo movements that you want prevent movements that you don't want and modulate in a particular way.
Here's the other great thing. Your cerebellum. Your cerebellum also interacts with this premotor and supplementary motor area. You know your cerebellum is getting information from your inner ear, right? So it's getting information from your inner ear about particularly like static and dynamic equilibrium. It's also receiving sensations from the body. What type of sensations? Maybe touch sensations, proprioception, which is the position of my muscles, my tendons, my joints in a three-dimensional space. It's receiving all that information, going through it, combing through it. Then it's also receiving information from my premotor and supplementary motor cortex about the, pro, the actual motor plan that they want to initiate. It takes all the sensations, it takes all the equilibrium information, all the actual motor plan that we have uh, kind of set out, goes through it, and then sends back upwards its modifications. It sends back upwards to these motor cortical areas its actual modifications. So how does the premotor and supplementary motor cortex actually help to plan, sequence, and execute movements? It does that by interacting with two primary structures. One is the basal ganglia, and the second one is the cerebellum. Oh, that's so cool, man. All right, so that's what I want you guys to know with respect to how the premotor and supplementary motor cortex perform their activities. All right, and the same thing, remember I told you that they can be asked broad, you can be asked broadman areas on your exam. So premotor and supplementary motor cortex or your motor association cortex is actually given a particular broadman area. And this broadman area is referred to as broadman area number six. Okay, so that covers the premotor and supplementary motor cortex. Let's move on to the prefrontal. So now prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex, also known as the prefrontal association area. This area is super interesting because it carries out so many functions. It can really be quite complicated when you really dig into the nitty gritty of this prefrontal cortex. We're gonna kinda keep it, for the most part, to the most important things that you guys should take away from the prefrontal cortex related to clinical conditions. So prefrontal cortex is really your thinking area of the brain. But again, let's outline where it is. So just to recap again, what's this cortex here? Primary motor cortex. What's this cortex just anterior to it? This is your premotor and supplementary motor cortex, which is called your motor association cortex. We're gonna come back to this next one here, which is just anterior to it. We're gonna talk about that next. This is called your frontal eye fields. And this next one, the one that we're focusing on primarily is going to be this entire area here. What is this one called? This is called your prefrontal cortex. Now the prefrontal cortex is very important because it has a lot of different functions. One of the big ones that I think is really important to remember is it's involved with your personality. Okay, so it's involved with personality and it's involved in your behaviors, right? So it has some type of emotional type of uh, involvement here. The other aspect here is that it's involved in your memory, okay? So it's involved in your, what's called particularly your working memory. So taking short-term memory plus rehearsal and helping to commit that into your working memory, okay? So it's involved with your working memory. The third thing that it's also involved for besides personality, behaviors, working memory, it's, it's also involved in your cognition. Okay, so it's also involved in your cognition, so your ability to learn new things. So it's involved in cognition, or your ability to learn new things. The next thing that it's involved with is your actual, uh, your, your reasoning and judgment. Okay, so it's involved in your decision making. So decision making. Okay, so particularly, you know, your reasoning behind making a decision and the judgment involved in that decision. So again, it's involved in reasoning and uh, judgment. All right, beautiful. And the last thing that I want you to remember of this is that it's involved in motor planning. So it also can be involved in motor planning, okay? So let's kind of talk about how the prefrontal cortex or prefrontal association area does this. The way that I wanna explain a lot of this is that the prefrontal cortex has communication with so many other structures of the brain, like tons, 
some of the areas to highlight here that it is communicating with that are important is one is called your one of the areas where you store memory you know deep within the temporal lobe you have this structure here called the hippocampus so you have this structure here called the hippocampus the hippocampus is really important for the memory aspect of your brain so memory is obviously important because that isn't going to be one of the functions of the prefrontal cortex so the hippocampus has to communicate with the prefrontal cortex the other thing is with respect to your personality your behaviors this has to connect with your limbic system and there's a lot of limbic structures that communicate with the prefrontal cortex what are some of these areas one of the areas is actually kind of deep in here we're just going to kind of show it like this it's going to be deep you can't see it here uh, it would be deep in the cerebrum but it also communicates what's this structure this structure is called the hypothalamus so the hypothalamus will also interact with the prefrontal cortex because that's a limbic nuclei another limbic nuclei is called the amygdala so there's another structure here deep within the temporal lobe <clears throat> and this also communicates with the prefrontal cortex again what is this structure here called this is called the amygdala so the amygdala is another important limbic system structure that involve influences our kind of personality and behavior the other aspect behind so that it kind of explains the working memory that it kind of explains the cognition that kind of explains the personality and behaviors there's another area deep within our actual uh, midbrain actually called the ventral tegmental uh, area so we'll draw it like this there's another area here called the ventral tegmental area and what happens is the ventral tegmental area which is in your midbrain it also can communicate with your prefrontal cortex and this is actually involved in a lot of your reward systems your addiction kind of systems which can also involve some of your decision making skills the last thing is your motor planning here's what's really interesting the prefrontal cortex can also communicate with this multi multimodal area back in deep into your parietal temporal kind of occipital lobe area there's this area here called the posterior association area and it, what happens is a lot of stimuli kind of end on this area so here in your occipital lobe we'll talk about it later but this is where vision it terminates that can be sent visual information can be sent to this posterior association area right here is where auditory sensation is involved in your temporal lobe that can send that auditory stimulus to the posterior association area and then right here is going to be where sensations like actual somatic sensations are actually uh, kind of uh, recognized and kind of uh, modified here and that can also be sent to this posterior association area so you have visual auditory and somatic sensations all communicating in this area and guess what all this can be sent to your prefrontal cortex to be involved with motor planning because this prefrontal cortex can communicate with the basal ganglia so as you can see the prefrontal cortex can be very complicated when you really dig into the details of it but what i want you to remember is how it is involved particularly with personality and behaviors and your memory is the connection between the hippocampus and your limbic system and then how it's involved particularly with kind of decision making is also via the ventral tegmental area and again some of these limbic structures and then again motor planning is the way it's connected with the posterior association area and the communication with the basal ganglia the reason why i wanted to kind of like talk about all of these things is because there is a very common condition that can affect and plague the frontal lobe let's talk about that quickly all right so i really want to quickly kind of explain why the prefrontal cortex is such an important area to know and the reason why is that there's a condition called frontotemporal dementia so as you can tell this condition is where there's damage of two lobes the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe we're really kind of focusing on the frontal lobe aspect of the frontal temporal dementia but what happens is, is there's actually going to be damage or atrophy of these areas so all the functions that we discussed are going to be altered so let's explain how and why it's important to know these basic functions remember one of the things that we just said is that there will be personality and behavioral changes what does that mean that means that the patient may have some degree of they might be aggressive right so they may be aggressive they may be hostile right 
They may be uh, kind of very irritable or agitated. And that's because you've damaged the area that's involved with their normal personality and behavior, right? So that's relatively straightforward. The other aspect here is their working memory. Now, generally, memory becomes affected a little bit kind of later in the disease process, usually not early. It's usually later in the disease process. But if you damage the prefrontal cortex, you can bet that later on, potentially, that they may have some type of memory loss. And here's the big thing, not just memory loss of you know the past events, but also difficulty in learning new things or storing new memories. So you could actually decrease their actual ability to remember things and decrease their ability to learn new types of tasks. The next thing that you're affecting is their decision making, right? Their reasoning, their judgment. This is a very important one because sometimes this can cause them to perform certain types of behaviors that they would not normally perform. You can think about your prefrontal cortex when it's working really well as an area that says, okay, I want to do this terrible thing. Your prefrontal cortex says, I don't think that's a good idea to do that. But when it's damaged, you have no longer this ability to inhibit those thoughts. So there's a disinhibition in that sense. And so this leads to them having uh, kind of inappropriate hypersexual behaviors. So this can lead to increased kind of sexual hypersexual behavior but not in a good way, in an inappropriate way. It also might lead to gambling, right? Because you're taking away that area that is kind of helpful for reasoning and judgment. And also, it might actually cause the patient to be a little bit apathetic. But again, that kind of comes with the personality behavior aspect as well. The last thing is that sometimes, remember what I told you, the prefrontal cortex, what do we say, just so we remember? This can communicate, it does this motor planning by communicating between the posterior association area to the prefrontal cortex, and the prefrontal cortex can communicate with the basal ganglia, which communicates with your motor cortex. So if you damage the prefrontal cortex, you're affecting the communication with your basal ganglia, affecting the motor cortex output, right? Particularly, this can lead to actually Parkinsonian types of symptoms. So later on in the disease, they also might develop motor deficits, but the motor deficits that they actually develop present more in a Parkinson's type of presentation, Parkinson's-like. So remember, we talked about how primarily this frontal temporal dementia affects the frontal lobe. And when it affects the temporal lobe, it's more likely affecting speech and the ability to comprehend language. So that whenever this is damaged, it can actually cause aphasia on top of the things that we just talked about. All right, again, just to, again, remind you that sometimes these can be questions on this in the exams. The broad area for prefrontal cortex, there's so many different areas. So it's a very wide range of areas. So some of the areas that we're gonna mention here, actually are, there's a couple of them. So it can be anywhere from numbers eight to 14, right? And then you can add on to that 24, 25, 32, and 45 to 47. So there's a lot of different areas, Broadman areas for this prefrontal cortex that it actually encompasses. Okay, so that covers our prefrontal cortex. Let's move on to the frontal eye fields. All right, the frontal eye fields. This is actually a really cool area, the frontal eye fields. So again, remember your kind of uh, areas here. This is our primary motor, right? Then just anterior to that is what? Your motor association cortex, which we said is made up of the premotor and the supplementary motor cortex. Then we've already discussed the prefrontal cortex, which is pretty much all of this portion here, right? All of this. And so this next portion that we're gonna discuss right now is the frontal eye field, which is about right here, okay? The frontal eye field is actually really interesting. We said it's involved with the voluntary movement, or voluntary rapid eye movements. But remember we said it was actually specifically called saccades. So it's actually more particularly involved in saccadic eye movement. And this is basically saying rapid eye movement. But to be more specific, because we're engineers, we like to know a little bit about this stuff, not going into crazy detail, how does this frontal eye field cause saccadic eye movements? Well, in the actual brainstem, you have a couple areas here that we have to talk about. Really briefly, this one here, this red nucleus here, 
is actually the nucleus of cranial nerve three. This green nucleus here that we're gonna kind of zoom in on here is actually cranial nerve six, abducens. And then this pink structure here, which we're gonna talk about, definitely gonna abbreviate this one. It's called the paramedian pontine reticular formation. You definitely know why we're abbreviating that bad boy. But again, these are the three areas that the frontal eye fields are gonna communicate with. All right, so now what I want us to do is pretend that we're looking here at the frontal eye field and kind of zooming in on it. So imagine here I have a frontal eye field, right? And this particularly is the right frontal eye field. Over here we'll have another portion. This would just be the left, which we can't see. But this would be your left frontal eye field. The right frontal eye field will actually send its neurons to the left paramedian pontine reticular formation, which we discussed here. So this is our left paramedian pontine reticular formation. This would be our right paramedian pontine reticular formation. So again, in that sense, these cross. The, basically, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that these send contralateral uh, pathways to the paramedian pontine reticular formation. All right, let's mainly focus just for the sake of it, since we talked about right here, we're mainly going to focus on the pathway involved with this right side. So let's get rid of this one here. Okay, so if we follow this through, we have the right frontal eye field sending connections down to the what? To the left paramedian pontine reticular formation. When it acts on that left paramedian pontine reticular formation, this sends its axons to this nucleus here. What is this? This is your sixth nerve nucleus, but it's which one? Your left, your left cranial nerve six, right? Then two things happen here. When you stimulate the left sixth nerve, it does two things. One, it actually will send axons that go over here to the contralateral third nerve nucleus. So this is now your right cranial nerve three, okay? The other thing it'll do is if you stimulate the sixth cranial nerve is it will send axons out via the abducens nerve to the muscle that the sixth nerve supplies. What is that muscle? LR6, right? So if you remember LR6, that means that the sixth cranial nerve supplies the lateral rectus. And the lateral rectus is responsible for abducting the eye. So this left lateral rectus will be stimulated. If the left lateral rectus is stimulated, which direction will the eye pull? It'll pull to the left, right? Now, watch this. The sixth nerve nucleus, not only does it stimulate the left lateral rectus, it stimulates the right third nerve. Now, if we stimulate the right third nerve nucleus, it's gonna do what? It's gonna go to what muscle here? The medial rectus on the opposite eye. So it's gonna stimulate the right medial rectus. What does the right medial rectus do? It adducts the eye. So now, which direction will it pull the eye? Medially. Which direction is the eyes moving? To the left. And which frontal eye field stimulated this process? The right. So the right frontal eye field causes contralateral conjugate, meaning that these two are moving in coordination, contralateral conjugate deviation of the eyes. That is so darn cool how it does that. So the reason why I want you guys to know this is that if someone has a lesion of the frontal eye field, now what happens? You damage this pathway. Now the left paramedian pontine reticular formation can't stimulate the sixth nerve. So this is inhibited. That means that the sixth nerve can't inhibit the third nerve. That means this is inhibited. That means that the sixth nerve can't stimulate the lateral rectus. That means this is inhibited. And if the third nerve is inhibited, it can't stimulate the right medial rectus. So now the eyes won't be able to move towards the left. What does that mean? If the eyes can't move towards the left conjugately, where, which way will they start to deviate? To the opposite side. And so because they no longer have those muscles pulling in the same direction, the eyes will start deviating to the opposite side. 
if they start naturally kind of deviating, we'll draw it here with this pink arrow, to the other side, which direction are they deviating with respect to the actual lesion? The same side, which is where the right frontal eye field is. So this is called ipsilateral conjugate gaze deviation. And that is why this is so important sometimes to just understand basic functions here. All right, so that covers our frontal eye field. Now the Broadman area for this one, it's actually technically a part, uh, considered a part of the prefrontal cortex, but the Broadman area for this is actually number eight. Okay, so Broadman area number eight for the frontal eye field. Now let's talk about Broca's area. All right, the last area that we got to talk about of the frontal lobe within the cerebral cortex is this last area, right? So we talked about this one a little bit. We said it was called the Broca's area, right? Because we've already talked about the primary motor, the supplementary and premotor, the frontal eye fields, and the prefrontal cortex. The only area that's left is the Broca's area. Now, here's what I want you to remember. We said that the Broca's area is involved with basically stimulating muscles of speech, right? And the big thing I want you to remember is we said that the Broca's area is located on the dominant hemisphere. So what does that mean? That means kind of if you have a right-handed person, that means that Broca's area is most likely going to be on the left frontal lobe in the inferior frontal gyrus. So left Broca's, right? Now the question is, is how does it stimulate muscles of speech? How does it help with this process? Well, the Broca's area, it communicates with a couple other areas. It actually communicates with this area we'll talk about when we talk about the temporal lobe called Wernicke's area. So this is called Wernicke's. And Wernicke's is where we comprehend language because it receives information from your visual cortex. It receives information from your uh, auditory cortex. Basically under, tries to comprehend and understand that language and then send that information from the Wernicke's area to the Broca's area via a connection called the arcuate fasciculus. But basically the Broca's area now will then take that information that it received from Wernicke's area about the language and the comprehension of it and send that information so that we can speak, basically give a response to what we are hearing or uh, seeing, right? So how does that work? Well, Broca's area is actually gonna be sending down, it actually contributes a little bit to those uh, kind of those, the corticospinal cortical bulbar tracts. If you remember, right here is our primary motor cortex. So coming down from that primary motor cortex, you're going to get some contribution from the Broca's area. And what this is going to do is it's going to come down, you know, to your actual brainstem, and it's going to give stimulation to particular nuclei located within the brainstem. One of these nuclei is actually called your facial nerve. Now the muscle that we're actually talking about here that the facial nerve stimulates is actually called the orbicularis oris, which basically helps to kind of change the shape of the mouth, right? That's important in speech because it kind of changes the way that we enunciate the process of speech, right? The other nucleus it stimulates is actually called the nucleus ambiguous, but that comes out via a couple nerves. One of the nerves is called cranial nerve, what? Nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. The other one is called cranial nerve, 10, which is the vagus nerve. And the last one here is the cranial part of the accessory nerve. All of these make up what's called the pharyngeal plexus. And this supplies a bunch of muscles. It supplies the soft palate. It supplies the uvula. It supplies the pharynx. It supplies the larynx. And this is the big one, the larynx. But all of these structures are important for voice, uh, for basically speech production. Okay, I'll explain all of it as we come to the end of it. But that's another thing that it stimulates via the Broca's area. The last area is the hypoglossal nucleus, which comes out via the hypoglossal nerve, which is cranial nerve 12. And this stimulates the muscles of the tongue. So now, if you have stimulation of all of these areas, think about that. Whenever you are basically pushing air from your lungs out, it has to go from the, through the larynx. The larynx has little vocal cords. The vocal cords, they're basically the tension on them is dependent upon the muscles, which is stimulated by the vagus, vagus nerve and the, a uh, little bit of the accessory nerve. 
So now, when these muscles are stimulated, it'll change the tension in the vocal cords. It also may change the shape of the pharynx a little bit. It may help to move the uvula and the soft palate a particular way. And now that speech that's coming up and hitting the vocal cords and resonating through the larynx, through the pharynx, across the soft palate and uvular area, is all going to have to go through a specific resonating pathway carried out through these nerves. Then, the tongue. We might per move the tongue in a particular way that helps us to articulate speech particularly, right? Then, as this, this speech is moving out pro across all of these structures, past the tongue, then we have the orbicularis oris, which kind of changes the shape of our mouth, maybe to enunciate or maybe change the way that we speak particular words. So now, how is Broca's area involved with muscles of speech? It stimulates all of these nerves, which stimulate all of these muscles that are involved in the speech production, which all have different types of functions, right? Why is this important? When someone damages the Broca's area, maybe because of a middle cerebral artery lesion, you lose the ability to speak properly, right? All of these muscles of speech are now going to be damaged in some way, shape, or form. So because of that, speech is interrupted. But how is it interrupted? These people, they're having difficulty getting these muscles going and really helping to get the speech moving. So because of that, their speech is not really, it doesn't flow perfectly. So it's called non-fluent speech. And another thing is they have a hard time being able to make their speech kind of grammatically correct. So it's non-fluent speech, but the other aspect of it is that it is completely grammatically incorrect. And the last thing here, remember I told you that Wernicke's area is involved in what? The comprehension of language. This area is fine. All we did was damage the Broca's area. So the communication from all of these areas, from your vision, from your auditory, and then the comprehension of those things being sent to the Broca's area is all intact. We didn't touch that area. All we touched was the Broca's area. So comprehension of language will be understandable. So they do have comprehension of language. So this is intact. Now there's another name for Broca's aphasia that sometimes needs to be uh, kind of expressed here. <laughs> no pun intended. It is actually sometimes referred to as because you can't kind of say what you want to say. It's called expressive aphasia. Okay, and so this basically gives us everything we need to know about Broca's area. Also, if you guys want to know what Broca's aphasia looks like, we're going to have a link down in the description box to a video where you guys can go ahead and see how these people have difficulty with their non-fluent and grammatically incorrect speech, but understand what you're trying to say or what you're trying to show them. Okay? All right, engineers, so in this video, which I know was long, I'm sorry, but I wanted to make sure all of this stuff makes sense and it's understandable. And if it is understandable, it does make sense. It did help. Please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, Instagram, Patreon account. You guys want to go check that out, follow us, help us out in any way that you guys can. We would truly appreciate it. All right, engineers, as always, we thank you, love you, and until next time.